This is uh, 1987. And it's uh, a multi-channel work because there's five monitors. And uh, it's before I started doing multi-channel audio. It's about a 15 minute pr uh, presentation on news media. And in those days, uh, it was kind of new for news media to be showing multiple monitors instead of just having the newscaster showing clips and you know that kind of thing. So these studios with all these monitors uh, kind of fascinated me. So I, I did this performance for television um, on a cable channel, cable uh, TV station, community TV station. And I've got a little clip for you. So that, uh, that was the first time I used noise gates to, uh, to help define a, a sound process and uh, to abstract the, the, the content so that I could work with it in, a, in an abstracted way. Um, and you'll see that in a, in a, as a kind of uh, protocol that I use throughout my career. Of, uh, I found noise gates to be very, very, a very, very interesting device and in, in for multiple reasons. Um, okay, I'll continue. Uh, it's not, uh, it's two uh, photograph of two different pieces, but related pieces done a few months apart. And uh, the top one is a piece called Between Edges. And you can see in the bottom left corner is a little mixing desk. And uh, this was a, a, a piece that I did, uh, a 10 channel diffusion uh, with the speakers in the sculptures on the stage of a dance set and a second stereo uh, diffusion in the house system so that you had the combination of the stage sound moving around and it was designed so that the stage sound moved with the dancers as they moved through the sculptures. And that was something I was doing, uh, uh, operating manually. Um, and so it, uh, yeah, it gave a, a quite an interesting effect. The dancers, I don't have a photograph of it, they were, they were dressed in white and uh, it was kind of Star Trek-y, you know. Um, this piece is uh, called Aerial Harp, and it was uh, a few months later. And then this one, it, uh, it's a little bit different. It used some of the same sculptures, but it also uh, used a, a wall-mounted uh, kind of like harp structures uh, that were actually functioning antennas connected to transistor radios. And if you see little, there's little uh, squares kind of throughout the space near the, the harp-like structures. Uh, those were transistor radios all tuned to different uh, radio frequencies that were available in that space at that time, including radio skip and so on. And then I created this, uh, this keyboard that basically uh, interrupted the power supply of the radio, and each radio had a speaker, so that when you typed into the keyboard, it created a multi-channel diffusion in the room because the radios were being activated all over the space. So the, the audience was in control of their... Um, the fusion, but what they were not in control of is what was on the radios at the time that they pressed the button. So it created this this rather abstracted uh, interactive soundscape. Okay. I have some video of that coming up, I think. And here's a detail. Uh,
So, um, in those days, uh, the electronic stores always thought I was interesting when I came in because I would buy a lot of wire, and they didn't know what for. So, you know, and it's kind of fun to buy a lot of something and not have an exact purpose. But uh, if you saw the, uh, the uh, computer uh, keyboard, the modification I did with that was just with simple stereo audio jacks and a lot of wire to interrupt the... When I started uh, working with, uh, got into the multi-channel uh, sound composition, I, I was reading a lot about uh, a concept called the squaring of the circle. How many of people have heard of that? A few. Okay. Well, it's uh, it's sort of primarily found in, in architectural, the, the, the references are found in architectural uh, uh, texts about... Uh, you know, the construction of a dome for a, in a church, for example, where you have the, the squares of the columns holding the, the dome up, and you have the dome, so you, you basically have squared a circle. But it's also about, it's sort of a um, magical or, uh, there's another word I'm thinking about, but uh, um, but it's a, a, a magical proportion, a ratio of, of, uh, of equidistant uh, squares and spheres. And uh, when I was reading about that, I realized that it was a very good way to create an eight-channel sound diffusion. And so the squares on each of these points, which are actually two squares overlaid to create the eight and a star symbol, but also uh, the positions of the speakers. And when you uh, uh, wrapped a circle around that, you really had the square, the square circle. So this is a proportion that I've used in a lot of my work, whether it's to design the... Uh, actual playback system or to create uh, uh, mapping architectures that I use out in the field when I'm recording sound. Um, but we'll get to that too. <laughs> so this is one of the first outdoor uh, concerts I, I did with the, the idea of the square circle. And this was actually a circular uh, uh, courtyard in Calgary, Alberta. And um, you can see that the speaker positions are based off those points. And this was the concert. And I, these are, are quite old. These are scans of photographs. So uh, in the video, too, they're all quite old. So I apologize for the, uh, the quality of them. And so they track a playback system. Actually, I, I would run a, I had an old post office van and I put all my equipment in the post office van and open up the back doors and and put out all the cable for the system and use the the bus the van as a kind of uh, control room for these uh, performances and uh, concerts and this is the that I played. So these low frequency tones were traveling around the multi-channel speakers, so they were moving in circles around you. Um, I'm going to fast forward because we don't we don't have all the time in the world to uh, listen to these pieces. Many of my works are 30 to 40 minutes long, so we're going to fast forward here.
That gives you an idea of that particular uh, piece. Um, okay. This is about the time I uh, got involved with the acoustic ecology people uh, and uh, Simon Fraser University and the Twinning of the World Project. Uh, the World Forum for Acoustic Ecology it was because I, I started wanting to, uh, in my sound design and my interest in sound and the idea of uh, creating sculptures that you could enter, which was one of the first ideas of making multi-channel sound, uh, I found that uh, the best way to make the richness I wanted to and the, and the randomness in the, in the soundscape or in the music was to use field recordings to create uh, as a resource for the music instead of musical instrument. Um, musical instruments, um, I find, and, and software that, you, that work with musical instruments are really um, uh, designed to be in, in beat patterns. And I, I find them quite rigid. And even today with the greater detail that we have and the greater resolutions we have and, and infinite amounts of numbers we can use, it's still, uh, I find, a bit rigid compared to field recordings where random sound can always surprise you with its, uh, its complexity and its arrival points and so on. And working with field recordings in multi-channel sound where you allow the relationships to sort of appear based off protocols that you've set up as your musical process um, uh, gives a kind of spontaneity to the, the music that I, I find attractive. Um, in this particular piece, which is one of the first recordings that I, uh, or first pieces I, I started working with field recording in a, in a very big way, uh, was based off the idea of listening. And, and John, I, if you work with him, he'll take you on a sound walk and, and start getting you to open your mind to the environmental sound around you. Uh, it's very important uh, to listen and li be a good listener in the world, um, not just a good listener in the studio. And when I was listening, uh, I was out camping in, in, uh, in uh, Canada, and I um, was listening to all the, all the sound of this valley I was in where my tent was set up. And there, was, there was activities all over the valley, uh, everything from the road about a mile away where I could hear the traffic swooshing past to the various different campsites where people were chopping wood or talking. And there was this, this, sort of, this very nice progression of acoustic quality that was happening over about a mile of sound. So I decided, I, I had the idea, what if I could get eight microphones and record that mile of sound simultaneously uh, from eight positions and record the entire mile of sound as one playable event? and then play it back in a sculptural architecture where each of those positions over the mile of sound, which would be about uh, 150 meters apart, uh, uh, would represent that one location. The effect that might be caused by that is that the compression of that mile, which takes, uh, to, uh, which uh, sound takes five and a half seconds to cross a full mile, from one end to the other, would mean that if you were listening to that soundscape in this architectural model or soundscape model that was now only 64 feet long, if you walked the 64 feet faster than five and a half seconds, you were conceptually traveling faster than the speed of sound. And this kind of uh, point reference um, multi-channel immersion from that kind of early beginning is something that I really can't get enough of. So playing with the, the not only the architecture of the playback system, but the architecture of the way I record and the distances that I record plays around with the spatial relationship of how sound is perceived and, and the echolocation of how we perceive sound. Because when I'm in a room like this and my voice is assisted here, which is slightly artificial. If it wasn't artificially assisted, you would locate my sound on this stage because my sound was being produced here. 
And, and if you start making uh, tests with your microphones and you record me like this microphone, you have a close proximity, so you have a, a tight representation, a near, a near field representation. And it, it has a, a psychoacoustic effect compared to if that microphone was in the far back corner trying to record me with all of the space between the microphone and myself, and to be honest, all of you in the middle. Because all of that sound of you and all of your bodily presence would be between that microphone and my voice. And so rather than being something to be concerned about as an obstacle in your creation, I, I prefer to think of it as a, as a process and a protocol to invite in if I want it. And it's just a matter of being aware of what you want and what you need when you go into that process. Okay, so so that's the this piece is called the acoustic line as the crow listens. It uh, is uh, a mile of sound reduced to 64 feet. Uh, I recorded eight different locations that, of mile long sounds, and I played them on rotation in the uh, in the construction in the exhibition. And uh, they went from natural sounds to street sounds, and even a set of church bells and a football game. And the football game was shorter than a mile, but it's kind of cool anyway. Um, and uh, there's a couple of technical issues about this that I want to mention. Because in those days, to record eight channels 150 meters apart and have them synchronized was difficult. There was no digital recorders, and if they were, you would have to, uh, it was like 3000 bucks for a DAT recorder. And to get eight of them to have a crew go out was ridiculous. It wasn't going to happen. Okay? So what I ended up using, actually, was video camcorders with the PCM uh, audio on them and a PZM microphone because it was omnidirectional. And they were battery operated. And I could take them out in the field with my crew and uh, use a two-way radio, a uh, set of eight or nine two-way radios, and broadcast over the radio a synchronizing tone that would be recorded by all the devices simultaneously, and then take it back to the studio and synchronize it with the tone. So I'll just show you a couple of photographs of the process in this. There's one of the maps uh, with the look. And the, the piece was called The Acoustic Line as the Crow Listens, and all of my team were, were called crows, <laughs> and each with a number, and I, I was crow leader. And that was at the football stadium. And you can see the uh, cameras on and microphones on uh, pieces of wood that were gaff tape black, so they look kind of cool. There they are there. Actually, in one location, one of my recorders was on a, a, a path where bicycles were going by. And he said that the bicycles kept slowing down when they went by because they thought it was a speed trap.
I'll leave it there because I, I really have to be careful of our time. Um, a technical point on that is even though I devised the system re to record eight digital recordings, because the, the important thing about the video was that they have crystal, uh, uh, crystal time code in the cameras. Uh, that's important for video or you wouldn't have a stable picture. Uh, so that affected the audio as well, that it would be exactly the same length from camera to camera. But I was still working with analog technology in the studio, so actually I could sync the first part of the, the uh, composition with the time code. But how many know what wow and flutter is? A few? Yeah. It's uh, on analog devices, they do not have that crystal sync like a digital device or a video camera. So over time, uh, the motors in, the, in, a, in an analog system speed up and slow down in a very, very small percentage, but they do speed up and slow down. So if you have a piece that's 20 minutes long, you could be about a, sync, a, a second off in sync by the end of it, depending on the, the quality. So um, if you were a real uh, audiophile and you saw the eight-channel cassette recorder playing back the, the piece, you might say, Steve, you didn't have that in sync. You would be right. <laughs> I have later synchronized it using digital equipment, but at that time it wasn't available. So um, we will continue. Ah. I did a, a series of pieces after the Tuning the World Conference. I talked to a, a fellow, Andres Brassard, a Swiss composer. Who, uh, who had been uh, doing concerts in the bottom sides of railroad bridges and, and valleys in Switzerland and uh, broadcasting sound throughout the valley and sometimes traveling 30 miles. He was doing many different wonderful things. And he was calling the time, he, he had defined the time uh, response and signal uh, of that kind of work. Uh, he defined it as sound saving, that uh, you work with the... the, the uh, the temporal uh, qualities of sound in big space. And uh, that kind of drift was just part of the process. And you learn to work with it. And as I said, his term was called sound sailing. So I, I had already been working with multi-channel stuff and live microphones. Uh, and I did a series of concerts uh, now with a new term to, to call the process, sound sailing, um, where I put live microphones into the space around me. And then the sound system, and this, this was an old ruin of a church in Winnipeg, uh, Manitoba, Canada, where the speakers were throughout the ruins of the church. And I would amplify, over-amplify the, uh, uh, the speakers at sometimes, or amplify the inputs deliberate to, deliberately to create feedback loops. I would also use some delays, and I had a semi-portable rig there. And uh, I would... Uh, I would uh, use a simple sound source to, to start the mechanism triggering. So in this piece, uh, clocks, stove clocks, mechanical stove clocks, and this kind of thing, so that the sound of ticking was the primary sound that I could amplify to create the feedback loops. And uh, by using a live mixing board and using the equalization, I could uh, control the, the tonality of the, the feedback loop and create kind of sonic waves that would travel from one part of this old ruin into another part uh, in these kind of wild things. Yes. No, they've kind of died off, haven't they? I'll do my best to that, John. <clears throat> well, I use them a lot, yeah. Um, uh, PZM means pressure zone microphone. And it's a uh, uh, microphone that... Uh, uh, is an electronic condenser microphone where the microphone faces a plate of metal and records sound off the sound hitting the metal and being reflected into the microphone. And so they're, they're very interesting in the sense of, of a wide, of, of an of a omnipresent kind of recording. Uh, they can also, I've used them very, very successful as overheads on drum kits, for example, just two stereo microphones, you've got the whole kit except... But anyway, if you're doing that kind of thing, they're, they're very useful. They're very dur durable, and they were uh, actually quite inexpensive. In those days, Radio Shack had them. <clears throat> uh, 
I think they were 50 bucks each, which was some money in those days. Uh, but the, the word was and, uh, that they, Radio Shack had bought up a, a design contract from Crown Microphone that if you cut the ends off, which were mini jacks, and wired it, it was a three-wire system, you could put XLR connectors on them and boost the little power supplies from 1.5 volts to 12 volts, and you had a, a, basically a Crown Microphone that was selling for $400. And so that's what I did. I modified them and I used those mic speakers for various projects. Is that just anything else you can yeah, think yeah, of? No, I just, I just, yeah. Just kind of. No, they're more they're more like an architectural because it, you can put them on a wall too, and it actually the wall becomes part of the metal plate in a way of collecting the sound. It all kind of gets. Uh, it's a very interesting technology. Uh, so I'll continue here. I remember doing a concert, and right in the middle of it, somebody walked over to me and said, where is the sound coming from? Not now. Not now. Okay. So I'm going to play you a little bit of that composition. Fast forward. I'm going to leave it at that. Um, I'm going to skip. I'm going to go through these a little bit quicker. As I do that, I have too much work. This was an installation called Home Security, and it was at a time when uh, hardware stores were selling the motion detectors to turn your light yard light on. And that really wasn't around before that. So I created the system of, of five uh, bird baths with toy dogs stuck on them that uh, when they were activated by the motion sensor, the dogs would start running and barking and wagging their tail. And uh, so this was put in the gallery. And as, as you walk through the gallery, uh, the motion sensors would cause these guys to go off and bark at you. Uh, on the opening night of this piece, um, the dogs barked so much that they started smoking. <laughs> so it, it nearly started on fire. But anyway, we survived, and we're, we're still going. Okay, this is, uh, this is a piece called Metaphenophone, and uh, it, uh, it has uh, security cameras. There was another thing that started becoming big digital security cameras uh, with a monitor set in the middle facing the, the mirrored uh, uh, screen that I built. And the mirror and the amber glass is a reference to visual arts and the clogged glass of, of looking at the universe through an amber glass to give the golden light of God. Um, in this case, if you walked up to the piece and stand, stood beside the plinth, you were in, uh, in the standing position for one of the cameras. Uh, to take a picture of you to show it on the monitor. And the monitor ref was reflected in the mirror, so you saw, saw yourself through the camera, through the monitor, in the mirror. And then the camera would switch to the other side. There was an audio component uh, and uh, wasn't really great electronics on these things, so when they switched, it created this big boom of uh, electronic shorting kind of thing when it switched from one camera to the other. And, uh, and I had set a, an echo up on it, so it would be boom, dum dum. It was kind of this weird uh, sort of uh, sense of surveillance uh, that it presented. There was also uh, a number, I think there was six or seven of these side panels that I built out of steel and a, 
and a mirror and a, and a uh, amber plexiglass. And they were placed out. This was in a museum in Calgary. These satellites, there was two uh, in the installation, but then the, the other five were placed throughout the exhibitions in the, in the museum. So that you could go into the 17th century uh, artworks and see this mirror sitting there in amongst the rest of them. And uh, so that was kind of fun. Again, the idea of, uh, of meta is to be layered. And, uh, so do you see it? The second one above the chair. And that's another uh, that's a piece I called uh, the acoustic field intensifier. And uh, uh, that was interesting because I thought it was a, a device for listening, but it turned out to be a much better device for amplifying voice. So if you put that on, you, you became omnipresent. The bucket, uh, it actually was set up in installations where it was hung from the ceiling, and the bucket was full of bolts to counterweight it so that you could adjust it over your head. And, um, and I just thought it was funny to have a bucket of bolts with the piece. And then many years later, I did a performance with a friend of mine uh, uh, where he was using a, what he called a sound can. And he did a kind of lasso trick with it. And so I created a composition with a, a two-track uh, uh, asynchronous audio. And uh, we walked in proximity to each other and did a kind of parade to launch this festival in Toronto. And uh, so this parade was in this big park. And there he is doing his sound can lasso work near the pool. And I'm directly across from him. You gotta have fun sometimes, not just uh, you know in your own head. Um, this is uh, this is a piece called uh, the Forum for the Alienation of Art, and it was uh, it was uh, played a, a, a part of one of the first uh, Isaiah conferences. Uh, I think it was the second or third one in Montreal. And it was in a big courtyard that w had been turned into an art center that uh, uh, had been an old factory. And in my dadist kind of formation, I, I put this speaker cluster on a clothesline because Montreal is full of these clotheslines. And, uh, and a little umbrella for the, also for the dadas, but also as a rain shield, of course. And over the, uh, over the, the soundtrack was uh, some bird calls and, uh, and a manifesto about the alienation of art. And um, I'm not going to go through that, but it's quite funny because it's, a, it's it basically says that uh, it's based off the dictionary definition that art is not nature. And in the manifesto, I make the case that, that then humanity uh, uh, cannot do art unless humanity is part of nature. So I guess that would be the alienation part. Okay, a residency in 1995 called Spin Cycle, and I will play a little bit of audio for that. Um, and this is where I'm seriously getting to the sound mapping, using similar kind of ideas that were done in the acoustic line as a crow listens. Uh, this is a quadraphonic uh, arrangement to record the spinning of a roulette wheel. And uh, it was interesting because it was a real casino, and... Uh, uh, we got permission to go to the casino after hours to record the roulette wheel. But if you see, all the chips are on the table. And we were told later by the security person and the, and the supervisor that they were keeping a big eye on me and my crew uh, to make sure we didn't take any chips. And it, because there was a lot of money sitting on the table, actually. Uh, and the funny thing was that it didn't even occur to me because I was so obsessed with recording the roulette wheel. But... This is part of the, the same residency, and this is the equipment I was using to make these compositions. It was a TIAC reel-to-reel, an 80-8. It was half-inch tape. And all my, all my uh, productions up until 95, 96 used this reel-to-reel. -reel. 
And in fact, I went on tour several times with this in the back of that little truck I had and drove across the country with it. It weighed about uh, 100 pounds. And I uh, would come in and do my fixed media concerts in 8-channel with uh, this device and my, uh, my own. These speakers are speakers I built. And there's the cute artist. And we're going to go back to that. And I will play you a little bit of Spin Cycle. I should say cute and sensitive, right? So this is a pitch change down, pitch change uh, quad recording created in multiple layers and it would be moving in the eight channel sound system so that you would feel the spinning of the wheel around you. And then I reversed the sequence so a second set were running in the opposite direction so that you, in the composition you had this double circle happening that uh, actually in those days, some people left the room because it, it made them dizzy. forward. So the little bit, of course, at the end was uh, the actual roulette wheel and the composition was made entirely from that sample. Other than the, the vocal stuff, which was ambient stuff recorded when we went to record the wheel. Okay. Onward. Uh, yeah, I was searching for photographs. I didn't know, I didn't check the size on that. So. Sorry about that. Can you see it? Not very well. Uh, maybe there's a bigger one coming up. No. Can you see that better? Can you kind of get an idea of what's going on there? I'll, I'll explain it while we're in this position. and the video, you'll see a little bit more of it. Um, this is 1996, and I created a, a piece called Sound Pool, the Manufacturing of Silence. Uh, with the idea of creating, uh, with the concepts of, of creating uh, out-of-phase sound frequencies to 
to create silence. Uh, I don't know if you'll get it, you'll probably get into those concepts. Uh, but if you if you uh, the theory is if you have a sound wave which is the room moving at a uh, in a wave form and you and you take a recording of that sound and you invert the sound at the, at the same rate but invert it so that the phase is in the wave in the opposite direction then the two waves crash into each other and reduce the amplitude of the sound field um, so in this one I wanted I was kind of working with that idea but I thought well what if I just made one big dumbass powerful low frequency sound system that just overwhelmed everything and that was sort of the, the protocol, the, the, the concept. And so I, I went about, well, how do I do that? So I created these, these speakers, I called it Axis speakers, and they were big canvases because that's what a speaker is, basically. It has a, a driver and a, and a membrane. And uh, I put a, a servoelectric motor on it, a third horsepower electric motor, on a cam so that the, the canvas would push back and forth. And uh, that's why they were called Axis speakers because they didn't just go in a cone that was forward motion. They were back and forth. And, uh, and I built eight of these things, and they, they ran at three vibrations per second, three cycles per second. And so the idea was this would create a sound pool that really would stop other sound, or, or that was the, the, the concept, the, kind of a data, the hopeful concept. Um, what in the end happened, which I knew what it was basically going to happen, is that when you turn this on, the switch in the middle, uh, these machines just made a whole lot of noise. The, mach the motors running, the cams, everything was banging and bouncing, and uh, it seemed to be a bit of a paradox, which, you know, people kind of loved. But actually, in the middle of that, the three vibrations per section, per, um, uh, per second uh, vibration, Created a what what you, a body sound field, so that you could experience the, the frequency of those canvases as a body sensation, not as an audible. So it it uh, it didn't cancel anything that was in the audible spectrum, but it created this this sonic uh, this the vibrational quality that um, a person could experience metaphorically what sound is in physicality because sound is a vibration. And when you get really attuned to it, you can, you can realize that you can listen with your body as much as your ear, um, that you have a sensation of sound uh, physically, not just sonically. Uh, but this is a bit tongue-in-cheek, and I'll play you a little bit of video on it. You see the switch in the middle? It's a, you, you would walk in between, and there's a big green button that you would press. And uh, the canvases were all hand-painted with, uh, uh, because this was about making silence and, and blocking sound, uh, I used the patterns from the inside of letter envelopes, you know, so that you can't see, read the letter inside the envelope. And I uh, used those patterns for the canvas. So when the canvas started vibrating, which was about three inches in and out, so it's six-inch throw, um, these things got really psychedelic. And there's a, there's a promo picture of me in those days uh, in front of one of my speakers. And the word on the t-shirt is listen. I'll skip through some of this crap. Oops, I wanted to show you this bit. And of course I made it a, a great big green button to press.
When I first built this piece and installed it in the gallery uh, and started it up, the first thing that happened, I don't know why that's buzzing, I think it's an artifact on the video, but uh, the first thing that happened is that the, uh, the speakers themselves started kind of moving around the room like robots. And uh, because there was so much pressure in them and they were, they were relative, relatively light. So uh, just before the opening, we had to drill holes in the concrete floor and bolt them down to the floor. <laughs> And it's funny, the different cultural experiences. Uh, in, in the West, uh, it was kind of like cool. And when I showed it in Montreal and in Quebec uh, with the, the francophones, they said, reminds me of beds. <laughs> John is looking at me. <laughs> um, now this is, uh, I'll run through this fairly quickly, but this is about 1995, and Max uh, programming uh, had just come out a few years before that. wasn't really known by anybody. Um, <clears throat> anybody here know Max, MSP? Yeah, so you kind of know what the patches look like. But in those days, nobody knew, knew what the patches looked like. And, um, <clears throat> and PD was a long time coming. Uh, I, I'm showing this because I, I created this composition uh, before I knew what Max was, and this is my wiring diagram for the setup of the analog system. And uh, I just thought it was always interesting, or always thought it was interesting that it looked so much like a Max patch. And that is the same, that's, that's the actual system wired together from that diagram. This is another mapping experiment of mine that uh, uh, in the middle in that plinth, if you look at the room, you, you can't quite see the top speakers, but in the, in the bottom two corners, there's uh, speakers. This is uh, an octophonic cube that I, I created in, in the small cubial gallery. Uh, and the, in, the, uh, in the plinth under the glass is a, a children's toy. I don't know if you know it, uh, it's a penguin toy where the penguin kind of goes up a ladder and then they slide down the spiral uh, slide. And I put up, uh, if you see there, uh, you can see here and here, uh, lavalier microphones. So I recorded, uh, I could uh, uh, listen to the toy uh, in, uh, in, quadru or in octophonic uh, and present that to the speakers in the room in real time. And uh, and going back to the acoustic line as a crow listens, playing with the spatial properties of that kind of thing, so that, in fact, if you activated the child's toy sonically, you would be at the scale of the toy when you were listening to it play. Uh, this is an iteration of the piece that you saw before between edges and aerial harp, and this one is a, the same 26 uh, uh, radios hooked up to the same uh, controller, but I created uh, two radio-like towers for it and presented it in some uh, art festivals. Uh, this piece was, uh, this version of it was called the Cacophonia. This is a, uh, a piece called uh, Hell is Just the Opposite. It's about 1999 or so. And in these, uh, these uh, conical things are some of the same lavalier microphones. Those pointing in four directions. They're hanging from the, the uh, center of the room and being run through a, a mixer uh, into wireless headphones. And... I don't have a photograph of that necessarily, but um, when you picked up headphones and listened and you walked around the room to all these objects that are hanging on the wall, and there's little wooden mallets, and these were all kind of industrial farm objects that you could strike with a mallet and it would make a tone. But because you were listening to the headphones, which were amplifying the sound from the center of the room, when you struck a sound in front of you, it would feel like it was coming from behind you.
or if you struck it on this side, it sounded over here. It really played with our perception of where the sound was coming from. And uh, it was quite successful, actually, as a this relatively simple concept. And some concert footage. How much time do we have? I don't want to. I don't want to short you uh, on the the new work that I'm doing. So I'm, I'm probably not going to play as many sound files as I had hoped. But in this, I was uh, running a, a eight channel sound system, uh, playing loops and samples. I was controlling a lot of the samples. Uh, with amplitude, like uh, the uh, the noise gate uh, system, um, that's a technical thing, but uh, uh, controlling uh, the currents of samples by amplitude moments from the bass guitar, as well as doing a lot of uh, 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 delay patterns and, and looping. So I was mixing live and playing at the same time. And I was a hippie then. Um, so this gets kind of into the middle part of my career, and uh, this was a very, very cold day, as you can tell. Uh, it's in Quebec City. I think it was minus 35, and a festival was about to begin. And I had built this, uh, this piece that I had uh, just moved to Quebec that I had, had uh, conceived of on the prairies. And uh, we'll go through the... the, the uh, the documentation uh, in a minute, so it'll make more sense, but I'll describe it first. Um, when I was making field recordings on the prairies, often the wind would get into my, my microphones and cause a lot of distortion, and I found it very frustrating. And then one day it occurred to me that I didn't have to be angry with the wind, I could just work with it. That's kind of about, about my, op my opening speech about using the sound space, the complete sound space. Uh, with the sound. And uh, so I started making compositions that, that basically use the amplitude events of wind to control spatializations of other sounds. Um, and so it was this kind of layered uh, uh, system of, of protocols that I, I developed to create natural sound diffusions uh, that weren't based on, you know, mathematical algorithms. It was, it was nature um, because the wind was being recorded in quadraphonics, so the events actually were occurring spatialized. Um, and and uh, one day I was looking out at uh, fields of wheat when I was in Saskatchewan, which uh, there are a lot of, and the wind was blowing across the field of wheat, and, and I somehow had never noticed it in a, in a way, but the, the wind was blowing across the field of wheat and wave patterns were being formed in the wheat. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but these rolling waves that are occurring, and it occurred to me that this was a, a perfect metaphor for the sound wave. But, how do you, but the sound wave is always in the studio and, and on the computer monitor and so on and so forth. This is a sound wave, a metaphor for a sound wave that is huge and kinetic and mechanical. So I created a, a sensor network of 64 sensors to emulate the field of wheat and to move in motion like a field of wheat so that it would, uh, the wind when it crossed would create wave patterns. And uh, so, uh, and then I could build output devices for the wave patterns that my sensor network created. What was really important about the system was that because I was on the prairies and I wanted to exhibit the system, if you put the sensors in the gallery, you don't have any wind. So you had to have a communication protocol uh, to, to uh, connect the wind sensors to the installation. So it was really important to create a system that could stream that data uh, uh, in a very, very light streaming data because we're talking about, in those days, a 56K dial-up modem that it had to be a broadcast on. So all of the sensors were built in 8-bit depth and, and uh, very light data, and it, we were able to create a 64-channel data stream uh, that was under 56K, uh, which was quite remarkable at the time. And so a final note to that is that once that started working and, uh, and I got the technicians I needed to help me build it, who were in Quebec, and that's how I ended up moving to Quebec, um, 
we were able to uh, set up the sensor network in Quebec and stream the wind from Quebec to uh, Helsinki and to Linz. Uh, this piece won an uh, honorary mention at Tars Electronica. And uh, uh, the wind uh, would be running in real time from several thousand kilometers away. And I might add, too, which was an achievement in its own, it would run for, for three weeks without break. So it was, uh, in those days, a, a stream was always breaking uh, for one reason or another. And uh, we, we were able to uh, maintain the stream for, for days and weeks at a time. So there's the sensor network. These, uh, the... Uh, the sensors, accelerometers in the bottom, they were not uh, programmed to record data in, in specific directions, but only in motion, because the network of 64 would give the information of direction. As the wind crossed the network, you would have a sense of direction. So that was one of the ways we could create a, a smaller amount of data uh, and still have direction. It was within the division of the information through the network. This uh, ran for the, the opening, but uh, soon afterwards, all the wires froze and broke and had to be replaced. So it was much better in the summertime. And this was uh, when it was set up in uh, Montreal. because I explained all that already. I want to have the talk to it there. So you get a sense of the wave patterns that I was working with. This, uh, this, uh, the first versions of this were certainly the uh, based off the of stream data, and I'll show you the uh, installation that was created from it. But it was uh, it didn't take me long to realize that the uh, the sensor network, the wind array cascade machine, uh, was too expensive to continually install and maintain. So uh, we developed a recording system to, to capture the data. So I now have an archive of wind in Montreal from 2003. I have, I have about four days of wind. Um, the other thing about the wind is that you, can't, you don't have control. I mean, it's the beautiful thing about it, but you don't control when it's going to be windy. So at times uh, when I presented the piece, uh, it would be calm, and people would look at the installation and go, <laughs> just, there was just nothing happening. So, but when it did go, it was, uh, it was really lovely. So the first installation was a, a system where there was a one-to-one -one relationship with the LED cluster that uh, looked like an amplitude meter of a mixing console. And uh, so the greater the tilt, the higher the colors would rise on the, on the light cluster. And this was another thing in those days, in, in 2003, LEDs would just come on the market and hadn't been used a whole lot. So um, we used them to create this. And uh, there are 2,880 LEDs that are soldered in these 64 clusters. And I soldered every one of them. And uh, 
and I lost some of my vision because of it because <laughs> I kept soldering the smoke, you know, and into my eyes, and I had coughs for a couple days, but uh, it's the dangers of art. People say it's safe, but it's not. I don't believe them. So this was it was called Pod, and it was to emulate, and that was before iPod. A year later, iPod came out. Like, ah. but, uh, so, uh, and it was to emulate a wheat field. These are online, by the way, a, a lot of these videos, if you want to look at them again. Because I'm skipping forward, you didn't see the part, uh, and it's an important part of it, but um, uh, the, the, the LEDs uh, uh, are performing silently, and the, the sound that you hear is the ventilation system of the room, which is true. So they actually are silent, and, uh, but there's always room noise, so it's apparent in this video. But as a second to that, at times, a few times that I've presented it in big international exhibitions, uh, I've had audience come up to me where the conditions were good, the, the room was quite quiet, and they would ask what the sound of the, of the piece was and uh, where it was coming from. And the fact was, and, and it wasn't a deliberate effect on, on my part, but I had been working with it to a, a, with a, in a little bit of purpose, is the idea of uh, synesthetic uh, experience. And what some people were responding to with this light cluster and the wind patterns, uh, they were having, it was producing a synesthetic response, and they were be being able to listen to the light, which I thought was pretty cool. That one I call child view. There's a lot of children that came in, and they would be under the lights, you know. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll go through this quickly. It was another one of my compos compositions, a quad composition that I was working with a performer. Actually, the guy that uh, was in the kilt earlier, if you remember. And so he had a suit on where he had these lights attached to the arms. And uh, the video is quite nice of this because the red string is the sound can swinging around. Um, that was in a, in a quadraphonic, uh, quadraphonic sound around him and sound coming from his sound can spinning. Gordon Monaghan uh, did some amazing work with the sound can. He was here last year. Okay, this is another series of works. Uh, you can't really see that one. It's a little bit whited out. Uh, I did a series called uh, Songs of Place. And uh, they were a combination of video and sound, which I've always do done, partly because of the technology. Like I said in the first one, the acoustic line as a crow listens. The audio technology didn't exist to do what I wanted, so I used video cameras, which ended up meaning that I had video for the piece, which I've never used for, for that earlier one. But uh, many of these projects I've done shot video and sound at the same time. And the, uh, the Songs of Place uh, series uh, was, uh, was uh, yeah, back to kind of the squaring of the circle motif. Um, I would take that template of the, of the circle with all the points on it, and I would drop it on top of a, a city map, 
looking for the center of the of the the motif to be the center of the city, and I would position that draw a circle on the map uh, to the water's edge because there's hardly a city in the world that doesn't have a waterfront, and that would be my de de defining circle, and then I would use the compass rose to find eight directions or twelve directions. And wherever the, the bisection of the circle and the direction was is where I would record. And I would record with a quadraphonic microphone array so that each recording, each location was recorded in quad, always with microphone one pointing north so that when I came back to the studio and layered these uh, recordings, uh, quadraphonic recordings, uh, the directions were consistently rendered in the same place. And then using some techniques with noise gates and so on, I, I created a kind of fabric of sound in each um, recording of the sound, instead of playing continuously, uh, was randomly cut up. Uh, and when they were all layered together, it was like a fabric where the threads of the sound were woven together with the idea of getting a total sound of a city as opposed to a location sound of one street corner or one experience. It was a super omni kind of experience. And, um, and then the video was done in similar ways where I would record video at each location and then find ways to create, uh, uh, to be able to, to uh, play all the video at once <laughs> without, without again layering them, I'd, I'd cut it up. <clears throat> and the cut-up idea, this was a performance in New York. And actually, uh, because the video was shot on 4x3, uh, I always intended actually to show these works side-by-side side, uh, or in multiples so that the uh, it wasn't so square. The concert in uh, Vienna. And this is about three minutes long, so I'm going to let uh, What's next? Ah. 
So there's the video camera and the half the hippie dude with the quadraphonic microphone ray in Vancouver. And uh, the slightly cleaned up uh, rad, uh, revolutionary with a, a different version of the microphone array in Vienna. Um, yeah. There is a publication on that, and there's information online if you want to know more about it. Uh, okay, this was... Uh, I'll just go through images uh, to get to the final work and, and demos of that. But this was a piece called Paravant that was actually made from the uh, those crickets that in this building. Uh, it gets me every time. <laughs> the digital cricket. I'm going to have to think about that. There's a work in that somehow. Um, probably has been many works in that. Uh, this is a video generated from the wind data. And in this particular instance, uh, I created a special screen. Now we have a screen that is like this called acoustic screening. Um, but that didn't really exist in, when I made this. So I, I actually made panels, uh, 16 panels, uh, to create the screen. And they're, uh, I can't think. It's a, it's a special driver that you can mount to the back of a picture that makes the, the your photograph or, or artwork uh, uses the surface of the artwork as a, a, a speaker membrane so that the uh, the sound comes out of the picture. So I created these uh, the screen from in 16 uh, uh, modules so I could have uh, independent speakers in the screen. And when I uh, visualized the wind, I also sonified the wind so that as the image moved across the screen, the sound would follow in the screen. So you had this kind of one-to-one uh, -one relationship with the audio and visual and playing around again with concepts from synesthetic kind of cross-modality or, or the idea of cross-modality of, of multiple senses being uh, uh, influenced at one, at one time. So in this case, the, the amplitude of the sensors was converted into a, sound, a sine wave. And uh, so if I wanted to, each wind sensor could be a sine wave. And uh, they would create uh, harmonics as they, uh, as they moved. So the screen was as big as this. When you went up to it, you really felt the movement of the, of the, you experienced the image as sound. Recorded a little bit hot. Could you hear the uh, distortions? Okay, we'll just have a, Okay, so we're moving on. Um, that, that last image was Paravant in uh, Latvia. Um, and all of the extra sound that was in there was in the exhibition space. It was a big sound, uh, a big exhibition called Waves. And the trouble with sound exhibitions is that, as yet, we have no real way except for individual rooms for artists to produce their works in. Uh, when it's put into a big gallery space with other works, you have a lot of cross-contamination of sound. Not so much in visual that you worry about because you have a field of focus, but the omni, om, omnidirectional quality of sound makes it very, very difficult to curate large sound exhibitions. Um, and if you ever get into a non-respective sound artist who decides, I can't hear my work well enough and turns up the volume a little bit, and then somebody else says, well, now I can't hear my work, and they turn it up a little bit. It gets to be like a, a mess. So uh, keep that in mind. Be respectful when you're showing with other people in, a, in an exhibition space. Is to try and keep it, your sound localized. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's there's few solutions on that. 
Um, this is uh, in my studio in Montreal, and uh, this is 2008, and uh, this is the sound system I created called the Turbulent Sound Matrix. And uh, the idea of the system uh, was 64 channels of audio, uh, eight speakers in eight columns that would surround you. And uh, using the, the visualization of, uh, that was done in Paragon uh, to create the uh, 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 image of the wind, uh, we converted the, that into a, a 64 pixel video where the data could be represented in black and white and uh, used as a control mechanism to inject the wind patterns into the 64 channel sound system as amplitude controllers for the speakers. At that point then you can, I could put in a single mono channel of sound like a cricket and run the wind, which, by the way, the wind is silent. It's energy. It doesn't have noise. What we hear as wind noise is wind on things, wind in the trees, wind on the fence, wind on a wind chime. Um, but really, wind is energy. So in this case, that energy is being diffused in the sound system, controlling the speakers in wave patterns, and taking that mono sound of a cricket when it's being played in all 64 speakers and through the wave patterns of the wind, creating a kinetic energy of diffusion so that the cricket sounds like it's somewhere between uh, uh, you and me and the rest of the park and the universe because it's, it's all over the place. But it's not using uh, delay tactics like echo or uh, anything like this. And again, because it's a natural pattern, the diffusion pattern is natural, you don't have this sensibility of uh, a mechanism. This is when TSM was launched at the Electro Festival in Montreal. This is when it was in Toronto. And in my studio for a listening concert. Um, the composition that was made for uh, the TSM, the first composition, was a 64-channel composition that was controlled by the wind and was, uh, had samples that were controlled by five other layers of wind that were, uh, that were laying the sound of the typewriter, the sound of the piano, the wind was playing the piano, a bit like a digital Aeolian harp, and uh, uh, the, to the sine waves that were created by the wind and two sets of diffusion. Um, I can control the speed of the wind in this uh, matrix, uh, so the wind patterns are faster or slower, and I can control the intensity of the wind, so there is a greater or lesser um, sensation of effect. And, um, so, so the Peace Sign and, and TSM also won an honorary mention at uh, Please Arts Electronica. Um, I won't be able to play this because we're running out of time. And this one is a performance uh, I called uh, Ripple Lipper. And uh, I'm, a few years ago, about five years ago, I, I uh, was really interesting what is a composition and what is a, what is a score. 
and I've always been interested in words. I've played in bands and different things, wrote a lot of poetry and so on. And uh, I've always made word plays as part of my, my kind of hobby and uh, maybe part of my cultural upbringing. Uh, so I started, uh, started uh, just writing for several years as uh, spontaneously as I could, uh, word plays that would pop into my mind or even words that seemed strange. So when you look at a word when it's handwritten and, and you think about it, it can look very strange. I mean, it's a weird set of symbols. So a word like not is actually just kind of weird to me sometimes, you know. I mean, is it not? Dogatory. There's one for us. Age we live. So this was uh, this was a whole series of word plays that I, I created and did several iterations on. Uh, and this uh, performance is three screens, uh, 500 invented words or phrases, and a quadraphonic sound system. And the music is uh, a quartet for uh, um, two pianos, a cello, and a bass uh, violin samples. And um, uh, the music is scored from the letters of the words. So through another kind of protocol, uh, it was a max patch, but it was based on a protocol I did years before uh, to transform letters and words into musical notation. So when the performance uh, was going and the words were coming up, the music was changing according to the word uh, because the word was the music. And this is another iteration of that five screens. Uh, it was in a, a latrine space or a window space. Uh, these screens uh, were on music stands. And there's a little tech of it. The curtain is up. This is more pictures of the TSM, in a, but this was in a concert series I did in Montreal called Sonic Jello after a year-long residency, and I invited uh, eight different composers to work with the system. And uh, it's a great idea to share your work if you can, and uh, when you do that, you can sometimes get these really nice rooms to work in. One of the concerts. And this was one of the setups for the installation. So if you think that a 64-channel sound system is noisy, it doesn't have to be. Because the, the wonderful thing about having all those speakers is you don't have to be loud to have full immersion. It's, uh, it's really lovely. Really, can, you can play at a volume that you can talk to each other and still experience the sound in a very, very uh, complete way. Safe enough for a baby as well. Oh, what's this? Okay. Now I'll talk about this. So this is another iteration of the uh, the Paravon project. Uh, of the square screen. I was invited to do uh, a presentation on a thirty six uh, a cluster of thirty six screens at Plastis Art in Montreal. So this is a public walkway on a, a screen setup that is uh, uh, commissions artists to present content for their screen setup. So I redid the, uh, the, uh, the programming for uh, Paravon for the screen matrix. And uh, they called it the, uh, the, the, screen, uh, the, the mosaic screen. Uh, so I called this iteration the Paravant Mosaic. Um, I changed the coloration, and instead of being a square, which was the grid system of the network, I uh, elongated it into a four by one elongation. So it ended up having this very wonderful flow to fit into the, the screen uh, matrix. What was very cool about this particular moment is that, uh, has anyone seen John Wick? the movie John Wick, John Wick 2. There's a scene in John Wick 2 that my piece is in it. <laughs> Q 
Keanu Reeves kills somebody in front of my piece. It's like awesome. So this is a, a larger iteration of, of the Meta 5 and Ripa Lipper works. Uh, this is 52 LCD screens with motion sensor startups. Uh, all of the words are played in slideshow mode on these little uh, digital picture frames. They're organized in protocols so that they, they have different, um, different sets of words so that in the 52 network, they never appear at the same time. So it creates this kind of poetic, uh, this, this continually changing poem as it runs. And this is the music that is made by the words for this quartet of, uh, of uh, two pianos, cello and, uh, and bass. I'm going to cut that and continue. I'm going to talk over this. These are photographs of a place I was at last year. It's called the Pengaluit Crater. And it's a crater that is in northern Quebec. Uh, it's uh, one of the newest craters on Earth. It's 1.4 million years old. And uh, uh, as a result of being so new, it's still very rugged. And I... I came to the idea with my squaring of the circle motif that I wanted to get back to that in a, in a bigger way, and this was a good way to do it. But I started looking on Google Maps for round lakes, and uh, actually it was really difficult. I couldn't find any. And then way up north I found this round lake, and it turned out to be this meteorite crater. And uh, the idea was to, uh, because of my mapping projects and the Songs of Place series and so on, uh, to go out and do a video and sonic mapping of this crater. And uh, uh, it was an amazing experience. There's, there's very little words to describe how big and massive and remote this thing is. Um, the campsite, the base campsite, we had to, we had to fly in and uh, fly in in a bush plane to this campsite. And then when the bush plane left, it was like if you didn't, if you didn't unload the food, you were going to go hunting, basically. Um, it was very remote. The camp was uh, two kilometers from the crater, and the crater was a 17-kilometer uh, uh, circumference. Um, it's 3.4 kilometers across the crater, and it's filled with water from all of the snow from a million years. The, the lake is one of the deepest in North America. It's 900 meters deep. It's also one of the cleanest uh, with the, the clean water test. They run a disc. I forget what the disc is called. They drop it in the water to see how far they can uh, see it. And it can be seen 120 feet down. So it's absolutely crystalline. I drank from that lake. I normally don't do that, but it was kind of this ritualistic thing with my uh, guides. So we walked around this crater for two weeks uh, making these recordings. And uh, I recorded it from... Uh, You'll see a photograph of the, of the camera using GoPros with a cluster on a tower with five GoPro cameras, one pointing down the crater and gradually panning up into the sky. So I have five wide-angle images um, and sound, uh, which was mostly wind. But, hey, I work with wind, right? So no problem. Um, and uh, uh, I used, instead of eight uh, positions, I used 12 positions like the hands of a clock. Uh, as the markers uh, to map this. And 
every second, or the odd numbers or the even numbers, however you want to say it, every second uh, marker reverse position. So the number one would look inward, and number two would look outward, and number three looks inward at the crater, number four looks outward down the crater and out at the tundra, and so on. So you get both the outside and inside. Um, I'm working on this project now in the final editing. Um, when it's, uh, the final manifestation is made, it will be um, 13 LCD screens, uh, the 12 points in one wall uh, with the 13th point, the, later, the crater itself in the center. Um, using LCD, LCD screens on their ends in a vertical position, uh, all of these TVs now have stereo sound. So by turning them vertically, you have a sound field that is top and bottom. And now I have, so I have a top and bottom to 13 positions. So I have a 26 channel diffusion that is, is not just horizontal, but vertical. And so that will be the sound composition that goes with the video, uh, the sound uh, protocol. There was lots of mosquitoes. Not so hippie anymore. That was my uh, friend and colleague uh, uh, who helped me tech the, the project. And I was walking down to the Crater Lake and being at the Crater Lake and walking up the crater. And there's the, uh, the rig for the cameras. So we would walk for an hour, take off the, the backpacks, set up the ar array and shoot for 15 minutes and tear it all down and then walk for another hour. So it takes about two hours for each shot. And so um, we, could, we couldn't really get more than three or four recordings done per day, depending on weather, uh, because you had to walk all that distance back. So three hours out walking is three hours back. Uh, so anyway, uh, we just barely got it done. My, uh, I only had two weeks. The funding for it was for two weeks. If I didn't get it, uh, so this is the mock-up demo. I'm not going to, I told you all that, so I'm going to skip through. It's online on my Vimeo, if you want to look at it again. So that's basically uh, the setup, the way it will be in the gallery. And uh, these, uh, these videos, uh, you know, it's a bit like watching paint dry in a way, because they're not sped up. They're wide angle. Uh, the clouds roll across you, but very slowly, so the... I've always worked with these slow kind of meditation kind of premises um, and uh, mesmerizing kind of premises. And this one, it's, it's really in real time, but it's, uh, it's very special because, and I haven't seen it yet because it's not completed, but when all of these screens are playing all of the clouds all at one time with the predominant winds blowing the clouds in, in a particular direction, which will be represented in the screens as either coming forward or coming across you or moving away from you, depending on how you are, uh, which point of view is being presented. Uh, I think it will create a, quite a spectacular visual image, even if it's going very, very slowly. And it will loop every 15, 20 minutes. Each loop is a slightly different length, so it will never be synchronized. So it will always be creating a new composition every time the loop changes. Um, I'll just show you some close-ups maybe of, I don't have anything kinetic in this because it was a, a mock-up. So anyway, it's quite varied. 
Oops. So that uh, that piece is called uh, the Thirteen Points of the Falling Star. And this will be the final piece that I present, and then we can have some uh, discussion if you want. This one I've been producing for the last three years. Uh, it's called the Seasons of the Rockwall Forest. Um, as you have rock, uh, rock fences in, in Britain, I know that, uh, all over the place. It's the same in Quebec. Uh, but many of these rock walls have been overgrown with trees and forests, so you don't know they're there. They, they were there when the first settlers came and built their fences and blah, blah, blah. Uh, so on the property I currently live on, uh, I discovered this rock wall fence running through the forest. And uh, I got a research grant to, uh, to work on new techniques of field recording and, and composition. And uh, so I decided actually to once a week to walk a path through my forest to the rock wall and back again. And I shot video and recorded sound and uh, did this for, well, about a year and a half uh, to be able to capture the season of, of the last snow to the first snow in the winter. Uh, and because I started late in the year one year, I had to use two years to get it to kind of loop properly. But uh, so it took, it took more than a year to uh, get all the footage. Um, I'm waiting for funding to finish this project, but it's also another multi-channel uh, uh, video construction with vertical television screens and or LCD screens and sound and um, what will happen in this is that the uh, the video of the five minute walk that I do to the the, uh, the rock fence um, and they call it a, a wall de rush in, uh, in back, um, I'm going to slow down the footage four times so that it becomes quite abstracted and uh, because when you're using a handheld camera, it can be very kind of uh, overly kinetic. So the idea is to slow it right down. And then at the end of the two pieces, I shot the, the forest from a longer view, and that's in time lapse. So there's a con uh, uh, kind of a contrast or contradiction between the slowed down images in the center and the time lapse sped up on the two ends of the same place. much text but they're, they're they are mock-ups so trying to sell the thing so you have to imagine these things moving and if you look at the group of them there I'm just gonna go back you can see that the two ends there's uh, something like 70 uh, there's 36 weeks that were shot a uh, two the rock wall video and a from the walk, rock wall video. Say that fast five times, I'm telling you, it's tough. Um, and uh, so they're paired, they're in these pairs, uh, left to right in each screen. And as you move down uh, in the reading, uh, you move through the seasons. So, you know, the first, uh, the first of the season is at the top left, and you're six weeks in when you're at the bottom or, and seventh week is at the top of the next uh, video uh, moving to the center and then you have summer and then autumn and then back to winter again uh, and I'll just play a, a couple of minutes of that and, and uh, and then we'll open it up for What's amazing about this forest is the transformation from this kind of nakedness and just 
sticks in the in the ground to this amazingly lush, uh, uh, almost unpassable uh, vegetation, and then back to these kind of uh, you know hibernation and, and sticks and snow. So the sound there is the actual sound from the video camera that has been also slowed down four times. And the sound design will use those sound tracks uh, from each of the sound uh, from the videos and be designed into a stereo field that is actually top and bottom. So it'll be a, a mixed fixed media uh, production uh, where that slowed, there will be, uh, how many is there, uh, 12 tracks of slowed down audio mixed together into a top bottom field. Uh, so it'll be actually quite a lot more intense than just that, that one slowed down uh, audio. So just try and think about that, imagine that, it's kind of weird. And that is my presentation. So we can do questions. I'll leave that up. Uh, thanks, Steve. Um, I, I was just checking Selcat actually, because I think there isn't someone coming in right after us. Uh, so we do have time for a few questions. I realize we've been here for a long time, but uh, I didn't want to stop uh, the narrative of, of Steve's talk. But um, uh, do we have any questions? Thank you. Uh, You're welcome. It's, is it working? Why four I, times? I heard, I heard, yes. Um, why four times? Uh, well, I've just repeated it. And uh, the reason I did it four times is that there's a couple of technical things. If you go past four times, it it, it starts to get too artifacty. Uh, in digital, uh, you're you're dealing with a dip that dip dip that <laughs> bit depth issue where every time you slow down sound you half the amount of, of, of quality. Uh, it's the same in analog as well, but it, it doesn't appear so much in analog the same way. So the, when you have fewer and fewer bits, you get gr more grain and, and it's so grainy that it becomes something else completely. So that's one issue. Uh, two, the, the, the software that I'm using only goes to four. <laughs> but... Uh, but technically, it's as much as I would want to do anyway. And when I do the rendering for the looping and to have a piece, you know, people come into a museum and typically only spend a couple of minutes with a piece. So to make a piece that's, uh, and I maybe one day will make a piece that runs forever uh, or several days or, or actually the composition for the big sound matrix could have run forever because it was designed asymmetrically as well. So it would all have been always been new. Um, with a kind of idea of an illusion of repetition because it's all the same information played at different timings. Uh, so time, a five minute video times four is a 20 minute video. And I felt that was long enough for an installation like this for a loop to have. Hi, thank you, well, well done, it's a really good show. Thank you. Um, um, how to change um, work a project you've done into exhibition? Um, how long is the process for that? Um, what is the process? How long is the process changing? Oh, uh, it varies from project to project. Um, as I've got older and more competent, I suppose my projects have, begot, have become more complicated, mm. and uh, so it takes a longer period of time. Um, in the early days, I could I could uh, get something done quite quickly, uh, you know, within a few days or, or uh, a couple of weeks. Uh, when you get into bigger projects, there's many different concerns that play a role in it because they become expensive. Mm. So you have to line up your sponsors, your funders, your whatever, 
you, which usually means that you should have uh, exhibition partners to say that, well, if you get this money to build a thing, it will actually be exhibited. Um, 